When you're sick and you can't fix it yourself, where over-the-counter medication just won't do, you go to the doctor. And what you want the doctor to do is you want the doctor to write a prescription, or often that is what they do, to resolve your physical pain and physical problem. You take that prescription to the pharmacy, you give it to the pharmacist, they fill it, you take the medicine home, and you begin the healing process because of, of a prescription that was written by a qualified person that you took to resolve your medical hurt, pain, and discomfort. Well, I'm sure you agree with me that this virus has been no joke. Corona is not playing around. It's this invisible invasion that we're all having to deal with, and it has caused quite a bit of pain. Medical pain, physical pain, emotional pain, relational pain, economic pain, political pain. I mean, it's just been painful. And you know, everybody's looking for a resolution, looking for a prescription that will work. Well, today I want to talk to you about a prescription for our pandemic. But not only our collective pandemic, but your pandemic. The things that are eating at your life in this environment, there's been a lot of pain, abuse, neglect, rejection, frustration on so many different levels. But there is a prescription that if we begin to use, particularly those of us who are in relationship with God, and if we take this prescription seriously, we can begin to see some resolve to not only the, the medical issue that we all are dealing with, but its repercussions throughout our lives, our families, and our broader society. God, the great physician, has a prescription for the big pandemic and for your pandemic. It's found in Isaiah 58, verses 1 to 12. There are three ingredients to this prescription, three, three medications, if you will, that if you take it, it'll begin a process of healing in your life and in your world. God's people were facing a crisis, and by the way, the reason that the world is facing a crisis is because we are facing a crisis. And until God, can't get, until God can get his people right, don't expect him to get the world right. He starts off by saying that the people were religious. They were crying aloud, verse 1 says, and they were raising their voices like a trumpet. They, they made all the right words. God, we want to know your ways. They said all the right things, and on top of that, they fasted. Fasted is where you are giving up a craving in the physical to gain something in the spiritual. Fasting is where you give up food or some other material, physical satisfaction and delight for a period of time and replace it with deep, heartfelt communication with the living God. Fasting is saying that the spiritual trumps the physical. And as bad as the physical is, I need the spiritual to invade it. Now, we've said it many times. Remember that if all you see is what you see, you do not see all there is to be seen. Everything physical and visible is always preceded by something invisible and spiritual. So if you want to properly address the physical visible, you must first address the invisible spiritual. So these people who were struggling had a religious veneer on them, but yet they had a problem because they say and in verse 3, we fasted, but we don't see you doing anything. We've humbled ourselves, but nothing is happening. Why isn't this working? Why aren't we seeing more changes in our lives and in our families and in our communities and why aren't we seeing the supernatural address the natural well that's where verse 4 comes in 
This is the first part of the prescription, by the way. Behold, you fast for contention, strife, and with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voices heard on high. It is a fast, this which I choose, a day for a man to humble himself. It is for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out the sackcloth and ashes as a bed. Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? The point is, you can go through religious exercise and it goes nowhere. You can speak Christianese, you can go to church, and it doesn't go anywhere. Why? Because the people wanted God to intervene without them changing their ways. <laughs> Verse 1 talks about their transgression. They weren't willing to align their lives in obedience to God while they carried on their religious activity. Being religious has a fulfillment about it. It can, it can, it can satisfy you. I'm going to make a confession right now. For breakfast today, I had donuts. Now, I love donuts. They have to be put in the oven for about, or the microwave for about 15 seconds. Let the, let the sugar melt just a little bit. Let it be warm. And, and those donuts just melt in your mouth. I love donuts. The problem is, while they are sweet to the taste, they offer no nutritional value. They're, they're non-beneficial. That's what religion is. It can be sweet. The sermon can be sweet. The singing can be sweet. The fellowship can be sweet, but it can be uh, sugar, uh, placebo. It doesn't offer you anything that changes you. It just makes you feel okay where you are. In fact, religion can camouflage righteousness. You can be religious while not being serious about dealing with the areas in our lives that block God from breaking through to us. Until there is the pursuit of righteousness, I don't mean perfection, nobody can be perfect, but the pursuit of God, meaning repentance where we are unrighteous, then you cannot expect the prescription to work. Everybody wants God to bless us, to bless America, to bless the world while we don't bless him. That's backwards Christian soldiers. He says, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to take me seriously. You've got to humble yourself before me. That is pursuing a relationship with me and a righteous life before me. If you're not pursuing a relationship and you're not pursuing a righteous life, you aren't pursuing God no matter how churchified you've become, no matter how many services you go to, no matter how much Bible reading you do, no matter how fasting, how much fasting you do, no matter how, no matter how much praying you do. It won't go anywhere because you're not doing the fast that he chooses, you're doing the fast that you choose. So all the spiritual sacrificing that does not pursue a relationship and the pursuit of a righteous lifestyle coming out of that relationship is a waste of time because God says, that's not what I'm asking for. You're giving me what you want me to have. You ever have people in your life uh, and they, uh, they're giving you what they want. They're not giving you what you need, require, or request. You know, when a baby is breached in its mother's womb, it's turned the wrong way. And so a delivery and deliverance of that baby through the womb is problematic because it's not turned right. And so doctors will often go in the womb and turn the baby's head down so it's faced in the right position because when it's in the right position, it's ready for a delivery. Well, you may be in labor right now. I may be in labor. Our culture is certainly in labor, but are our heads turned the right way? Are we breached? Are we, just, are we just going through the spiritual motions without the pursuit of relationship? In fact, they really didn't want to hear what God had to say. They just wanted to give him enough religion to make him satisfied. You know, a lot of people won't get on a scale. And the reason why they won't get on the scale is because they don't want to see what the truth is. 
They don't want to see what reality is. So they, they somehow feel better by not getting on the scale. <laughs> well, a lot of people don't want to be confronted by their unrighteousness, by our unrighteousness, by our rejection of God in government, our rejection of God in education, our rejection of God in business, our rejection of God in economics, our rejection of God in the definition of humanity, in the definition of marriage and family. We do not want divine interference in our unrighteousness. We just want to be made comfortable. He says, that's not the fast that I choose. So all the religiosity that you come up with is not addressing, you're camouflaging, and it won't bring about the very thing that you're asking. So the first thing that you've got to do is pursue a relationship with the living God on his terms, manifested in a increasingly righteous lifestyle. That is, you're living to please him based on what he says, not based on what you think, what your mama thought, what your daddy said, or what the culture says. Well, that leads us to the second prescription. And the second prescription reads like this. Verse 6 says, Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. He says the second thing you must do if you want to be healed yourself. We'll get to you in a moment. I've forgotten you. But what he says is that you must minister charitably to others. Now let's get this kind of ministry straight. This kind of ministry that ministers to others means that you're not a selfish saint. That you're not just thinking about three people, me, myself, and I. But that even in your pain, struggle, and stress, you are willing to minister to somebody else who's worse off than you. And trust me, I don't care what your status is, there is somebody worse off than you. You've already heard me declare Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Whatever you need, give to somebody else so that it can boomerang back to you. He says, the major sin was how they were treating other people. You can't treat other people any kind of way, some kind of way, and expect God to heal your wounds. He says, I want you to minister charitably and responsibly because charity must be done responsibly, the Bible says but to help people who need your help, particularly those who are in the same situation that you're in. Paul says in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, to comfort others with wherein the comfort that you are being comforted. In other words, help somebody else where you need help. God says, if you want a prescription for your own healing, there must be reaching out. And he talks about the hungry and the homeless and the naked. He's talking about ministering to others. So let's get charity straight. Biblical charity is where you serve the need of somebody else without expecting anything in return, okay? You're not asking for a quid pro quo. You're not asking for something in return. That's called business. You know, I'm gonna do this, let's cut this deal, you'll do that, this for that, that's business. No, he's talking about ministry now, servanthood. And everybody has been called to be a servant. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, you've been called to be a servant. How, how good are you serving? Who else have you helped recently? Yes, I know we've been quarantined for a while, but uh, the prescription says, no, you better reach out to somebody else. You're lonely, reach out to somebody else you know who's lonely. You're hungry, give food at whatever level you can to somebody else who needs food. You're struggling with employment. Uh, make a contact for somebody else who needs an opportunity uh, that they qualify for that you may not. They can come in a million different ways. 
but you're seeing yourself as a servant. It's amazing. How many people, when churches are open, don't go to worship service, they go to worship selfish. They go to find out what God wants to say to them, how God wants to teach them, how God wants to encourage them. And they'll do that for days, months, and years and never serve in a ministry, never help anybody else. He says, no, if you are unwilling to be a servant, then you can't cry out to me in your crisis to be served by me. Remember, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Why is it more blessed? Because that is the way to receive. The way to receive is by being a giver. And yes, that includes money, but it includes time and talents as well. Because people can write checks or give dollars as an excuse not to be involved. That's why we tell our church members when they hand out the act of kindness cards, don't just, don't just do a good deed, but pray with the person and share the good news of the gospel with the person. Because you're caring about people, not just fulfilling a program. That's also why wherever you serve, serve with your heart in it, your heart and your hands, word and deed. Let people know wherever you are serving that you care about them and that you're not just fulfilling a job description. He says, if you want to see me, then I need you to serve somebody else. It reminds me of the lady who, uh, the lady who uh, went to the mailbox one day and she saw a letter in the mailbox and said, uh, I'm coming to your home tonight for dinner. And underneath it said, signed Jesus. Wow, Jesus is coming to my house for dinner. So she wanted to make preparations. On her way to the store, she ran by a hungry family. And uh, she paused for a moment, found out what they needed, and gave them something to eat. As she came out of the store, because remember, she's getting things for Jesus, she ran across a homeless man without a coat. She went back in and got the homeless man a coat. She went home because guess what? Jesus is coming for dinner. As she went home, she saw a note on the door. And the note on the door said, thank you. Thank you for providing me a meal and a coat. Signed, Jesus. You see, the way you show Jesus that you love him is how better off your neighbor is because you love him. The way you show Jesus that you are serious and not just religious is because you're ministry minded with a heart that cares for others. We live in a dog eat dog world. We live in a me, myself and our society. But I'd like to suggest to you that the prescription for this pandemic to get God to intervene in our affairs, all of them, including, including the virus. Yeah, because the, the plagues don't escape God's hand. We see that all over scripture. He says, I'll heal the plague when you're operating by my plan. And I know that doesn't look like the two are connected, but they're very connected. And so, first of all, that must be the pursuit of righteousness out of a relationship. Secondly of all, that must be the service to others. And then, ah, oh, I know this is the one you're waiting for. And then, <laughs> then after you've done the first part, Righteousness, the second part, servanthood. Then you come to verse 8. Then your light will break out like the dawn. Mm. And your recovery will speedy spring, speedily spring forth. And your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the thing holding you back, the pointing of the finger and speaking of wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. 
And the Lord will continually guide you and give strength to your loins and your bones. And you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will rise up the old foundations and you will be called repairers of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which you dwell. Our streets are in trouble, aren't they? We've got injustice taking place, insensitivity taking place, unrighteousness taking place. We've got calamity in divorce, calamity in abuse. And then we have on top of that all this medical stuff. The streets are in trouble. You've got conflict between police and citizens, between Democrats and Republicans, between black and white, often between male and female. The streets are in trouble. But he says, if you want me to take care of the street, if you want me to join you in your predicament, then you're going to have to do this my way. You know, in baseball, you don't start off at third base. That's not where you start in baseball. You just can't come up the bat and then run left down to third base. It doesn't work that way. No, if you want to get home, you got to go in another direction. See, a lot of us want to start on third base so that all we got to do is one thing and go home. No, no, you got to go to first, second, and then third. Now you can come home. Well, first base is where you remove the bond of wickedness, he says. That is where you identify sin in your life, you acknowledge that it is sin, and then you repent of it. Let me define repentance. Repentance is the internal determination and decision to turn from sin. Repentance is the internal determination and decision to turn from sin. Now, how do you know your internal is real? How do you know that you, you really mean it? He says, because you'll show fruit of repentance. You can talk about an apple tree all day long, but until you see some apples, you're not convinced. <laughs> you can talk about a pear tree all you want, but until you see some pears, it's not convincing. Uh, no matter what's happening underneath the ground, until you see something, it has not demonstrated itself to be real. So anybody can talk a good game. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. But he says, no, you must loosen the bonds of wickedness. You must identify. And we all must do that from pulpit to pew. And we must repent with fruit of repentance, where we demonstrate to God and as necessary others that we're serious about our faith. And then he says, then you must minister to others. You must serve others. You must come alongside of others. And then he gives a whole litany, a whole list of benefits that will accrue when you get to third base, when you get to number three, the third part of the description. He says, your darkness will become light. In other words, God will meet you in your confusion. Because when things are dark, you can't see things clearly. And aren't there a lot of decisions that we have to make today? Do we go back to school? Do we keep schools closed? Do we go out to work? Do we not go out to work? But what about my, my age and, and propensity to the illness? And what, how far do I go? You know, we got all these decisions to make in terms of the collective, but we also have all these decisions to make regarding ourselves. And things get dark. Jesus says, God says in his word, I will turn your darkness into light. That is, I'm going to clear up things for you. I'm going to replace your hopelessness with hope. He says, when you do this, I will begin to work in you to bring soul satisfaction. I'll bring harmony and peace where you have chaos and calamity. He says, not only that, but I love this. You will rebuild the ancient ruins. You know, we're not looking at evolution of society. We're looking at the devolution of society. We're going downhill. We're not going uphill. I don't care what the economy looks like. I don't care what the you know, prognosticators are saying. We're going downhill as a community of people. 
the conflicts, the strife, the rebellion, all of this, the, the, the redefinitions, we, we, we going south. God allows crises. He allows calamities. He, he allows them to drive us to our knees, to humble us, so that we, become, we begin to recognize that we got to do this thing his way. There must be a radical return to God on his terms. And when there is this radical return to God on his terms, then we'll see God radically invade our circumstances, our situations, our lives. And this starts with the church. It starts with Christians. We want to start pointing at the White House when we can't even get straight our house. When we have illegitimate divisions along lines that God never, never would authorize. He will prepare your broken life, your broken home, and our broken nation if we will be broken before him, stripped of our independence and self-sufficiency. You know, on April 15th, well, uh, not true in 2020, but normally on April 15th, that's tax day. And when you do your taxes, you know, you hope to get back something that was given. You want to get something back. You don't just want to pay in, you want to get something back. And one of the things that determines your tax rate or tax uh, uh, income, what you will get back is what you served. You know, charitable giving, what you gave in terms of dollars. We want to return based on our kindness. Well, God gives a return based on our service. He says, then you will see God work on your behalf. You know, when a person goes to jail or finds a crime, one of the things that they, they hope to get is community service instead of being locked up. And oftentimes, depending upon what the crime was that was committed, the judge will give them a certain amount of hours of community service in lieu of either a fine or in lieu of jail time or maybe both. They say, let's do some community service and through your community service, reduce your sentence. Maybe you feel like life has sentenced you. Maybe you're that single parent and you feel like you've been sentenced to aloneness. Maybe you're that abandoned child and you feel like you've been sentenced to a life without guidance. Maybe you're that man and you've been sentenced to not being able to be identified for the person you were created to be. Maybe you're that person who feels lost and you feel sentenced about what your destiny, will you ever realize it? Well, God is allowing community service. <laughs> if you get right with him, become a servant to others, then he will meet you in your place. And when those three things happen together, you will have taken the prescription, even in this pandemic, for your healing, and if enough of us do it, for the healing of our land. I think it's only appropriate that as we take communion today, we think about these three things. I want to challenge you to enter a time of fasting, if you haven't already, where you give up a meal or you give up your favorite TV show and you spend some concentrated time on your knees, on your face before God, where you confess to him every area that you are aware of, where you fail with an internal determination to turn. And then you do something that validates what you just decided so that it doesn't just wind up being a feeling for the moment, but an action taking you in a whole nother direction. Find somebody to serve in an appropriate way, given the context of our situation now, and then tell God what you need from him. I want you to do that. I want you to spend a moment with God so that we can see God invade your life and our circumstances and bring healing to the streets, including the street that you live on. Jesus died to bring us back into fellowship with God. That's why he died, to reconcile us with the Father. His body was broken 
And that's what the bread is all about. His body broken. When you chew it up, he was chewed up for you. Give him thanks now as we eat in remembrance of him. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. God has determined that for sin to be forgiven, blood has to be shed. shed. And so what he did was shed his own blood in the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. So you could be forgiven and restored and then used. It all is part of the package. And return to your purpose. And you know the good thing about getting right with God? He can hit a bullseye with a crooked stick. So I don't care how messed up you've been, God can still hit the target for your life if you give him your life. It's all because of the blood. Shall we drink in remembrance of him? Father, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you and giving you the glory to your name. Receive your people as we take the prescription in the midst of our pandemic. In your name we pray. Amen.